So where would you say that your worldview has been updated in the last six months? Ooh, I mean, I think that's like I think that's always a hard question. I think I can give you a couple of profound ones, but I want you to go first. But like, I mean, I think the yeah. biggest thing to me has been like, and maybe I'm still coming to realize exactly like understand what it means but like I think I think the lens and the perspective that I'm seeing things from is slowly evolving yeah and like I'm seeing sort of the machinations of society and rather than as some big abstract machine like it's just people doing their thing and following patterns of incentives and doing what makes them happy for better or worse following what they think makes them happy even if it doesn't and i guess i've built a more profound understanding of how people who are collectively looking down at their feet and going this is what's rational can collectively be vastly irrational mm -hmm. and do terrible things like the global warming mess we find ourselves in. But it's all just a chain of people behaving individually rationally. Yeah, that's a good one. The individual um, ways of following some of society's programming that have caused us to find ourselves in so much of the error situations that we're in now. Yeah. Um, you're right. We're following uh, incentive structures that are that are misaligned with our collective interest. They're misaligned. Yeah. They're misaligned with our interconnectedness with nature. And this is probably one of the ones that I think is most salient for me is that our disconnection from nature is a is directly mirrored in the ailments that our civilization has. So the more that a civilization disconnects from source, from the planet that gives them nourishment, the system that sustains them, the more errors that you see in the society. It's extremely evident. You listed right. one the way we're affecting our ecosystems. Yeah. Like but people, people who don't see the big picture fail to understand deeply the implications of what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so much of that, like one of the big ideas in business computer science, like is abstraction. Like, I love abstraction. We just did an episode on abstraction yesterday. Aww. <laughs> on abstraction and creativity. Yeah, with, like, with Jeremy Nixon, who's actually a machine learning researcher at Google Brain. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a great episode. Yeah, and he is on fire about abstraction. Temporal abstraction, um, just like normal abstraction, transfer uh, learning, language, Creativity, we talked yeah. about so much good stuff in that session. I mean, I think abstraction in particular, though, can be very, it can be very good, but very dangerous. Like, if you, I mean, I think the computer science example is like, you are writing really high level code that is very abstracted from what a processor is doing. And then it breaks in some incredibly subtle way, and you're like, what the heck? Why doesn't this work? And you have to maybe dig through layers and layers of stuff that you that's totally arcane and you don't understand what it means to realize like it, it's some quirk of the architecture that you're using. Where if you start out with that understanding, you can go, oh, this is non-obviously not a good thing. But I think the same is true. Like I, ecology is a handy example where what really is good or bad for the planet is not something you necessarily want to connect to like 
Oh yeah, I went shopping and I bought out of season fruit. Like that's that's not a connection that just pops into people's brains unless they really understand like the logistics system that goes into that. Yeah, the reason why ab the abstraction of understanding the nature that sustains you is so important is because that is the source of all life and the lack of gratitude that we have to the source of all life to every breath that we take to every sip of water to every shower to every piece of food to the trees and the insects and the animals and the ecosystems around us to the ocean that's right next to us to all these things that have birthed us in here to this driving life force is the greatest disconnection that we've ever made in our lives. It's a fall from grace. And that's why seven plus billion people are on the playground just playing in the amusement park and not consciously connecting to nature, to what sustains them. That's yeah. been one of the most profound worldview updates that I've had thanks to the Colombian elder Mama Nui Juan, thank you. Thank you to that indigenous wisdom. So, so important, that indigenous wisdom. And the other really important worldview update I had was with, with, was with uh, reading Jun Yoon's book, Interdependent Capitalism. And I'll give you a copy of this on the way out. Um, one of the best books I've ever read in my life um, and it does an incredible synthesis at all the way back from the, the inclusive fitness that kin tribes have yeah. and how our family values just did not scale with time. Mm -hmm. And so we find ourselves in this massive global village of self-dealing, Stories used to be told in the tribe because I would tell you a story to help your fitness. It was both in our best interest for me to tell you a true story that would help your fitness. Now, in today's culture, people tell each other stories to sell them shit that they don't need. <laughs> and so you have, you, have, yeah. you, have, uh, you have politicians that are not aligned. You have doctors, physicians that are not aligned. You have teachers that are not aligned. All our aligning systems are off. We're obsessed with our nuclear families. We're obsessed with our kids. We're obsessed with our dogs and our cats. And we don't know our neighbors. And we don't find it to be, like we need inclusive stakeholding. Silicon Valley did something right, which was that they gave shares to the employees that were building the companies. Great, but that's only one step in the right direction. The next step is all of the customers that literally call the Uber on the phone should also get very small percentages of ownership into the company. They're the ones that are driving the worth of that company. And then Uber has found itself headquartered in downtown San Francisco for how many years? Almost a Quite decade a or something. Yeah. And it's going to be approaching a decade soon. And how much has Uber finds themselves in an inclusive stakeholding fashion with San Francisco. Not really at all. <laughs> Uber needs to be an inclusive <laughs> stakeholding entity within the city of San Francisco. They need to give back. They need San Francisco to be a shareholder of Uber. These are some Ooh. of the mechanisms of, these, of this universal basic asset movement, of this inclusive stakeholding movement, this global village of inclusive fitness movement that we need to move towards. And they recommend a lot of really good solutions to the problem. Like some things like blockchain technology enable us to have a decentralized digital ledger that shows how a teacher or a physician has an inclusive stake in their pupil. And that the, psychologi the psychology of terms like compersion, like that 
compersion means I feel joy when you feel joy, vicariously through you. We need new words, we need neologisms for these things. We need music that is not about money and women and materialistic possessions and drugs, but we need music that is about interconnectedness. So these two things together, interdependent capitalism along with the indigenous wisdom, has been like one of the most profound worldview updates for me and it's added, in, added into my synthesis a lot. Aww. I really like, I see an idea in there, like making the city a shareholder. I think, I think that speaks deeply to like the incentive structures of capitalism. Like there's this idea that I've never been totally comfortable with in like how publicly traded companies operate. If you're a publicly traded company and somebody owns a share in you, what obligation exists? Mm -hmm. To make money. Mm -hmm. Like, why that should be the exclusive obligation to a shareholder? Like, that, I, I feel like there's so much more that's important. That in itself is a corrupted first principle. Money, it's to make money. That's a corrupted first principle. The first principle needs to be to provide value to others, value, yeah. and not materialistic, deceptive value, but value yeah. of maximizing prosperity and our interconnectedness with nature. Yeah. I mean, look at all the people who go in and like leveraged buy out some company that's having trouble and just completely destroy it, all of the value that it built up in order to make a quick buck for themselves. Let's go through a practice, Nick. Yeah. Okay, so when we breathe. When we do that, what are we breathing? I mean, oxygen, nitrogen. What, <laughs> what, are we sustain, what are we sustained by? I mean, the oxygen that what our pro, cells what need produces, to move. What produces the air that's on uh, the planet? Uh, plants, mostly. Phytoplankton, yeah, plants too, yeah. yeah. And yeah, the, the massive ecosystem of the water cycle and the cycle of air, these cycles directly give us the source of life. Directly, not indirectly, but directly give yeah. us the source of life. Eating a plant directly gives us a source of life. So yeah. how, how disconnected do you think we are from that? I mean, in the last hundred years, it has grown at an extraordinary pace. Like... What else has grown at an extraordinary pace? All, everything. All of the issues have grown at an extraordinary pace, too. Yeah. And when we do things like take people out of poverty, we need to really look at things from a first principles perspective. Because... Doing things like tying people into monetary systems, for especially for people that are like indigenously tied to land and to the earth, they don't want money. They don't want to be part of the global economy. But we yeah. insist for them to be a part of the global economy. No, no, you need electricity. You need internet. You need computers, you need money, you need bank accounts, you need this. We've been forcing that onto people around the world instead of querying how they actually exist. How do you exist and connect to spirit? Learning from people who, are, who live different lives. We're so far up in our own asses here. There was a, a person that we're going to have on the show soon that made that they, they took and they scraped by city people's Twitter profiles and made word clouds 
of, the, of what were the most common things. In Silicon Valley, it's like product, design, Google, Facebook, blah, blah. In other places in the United States, it's father, wife, child, family, love, God, really, like values. It's a, it's a different life. And if you look at a word cloud of indigenous people, it's like spirit, nature, source, love. Names of things that are part of nature. Yeah, trees, yeah. plants, yeah. animals, yeah. Fruits. Fruits. Yeah. Food, water. Yeah. Yeah. So we are, you can take a word cloud of a area to capture the zeitgeist of their connection to spirit. What are they talking about? What are they thinking about? I've been obsessing with this stuff. <laughs> We're so disconnected. It's evident in our mental disorders. It's evident in the way that our social fabric is not inclusive. Yeah. There are promising technologies that were made, like the internet, that were supposed supposed to do the absolute thing that they promised to do, actually do the interconnectedness at the most pinnacle level. Mm -hmm. And social media needs the upgrade to do, <sighs> to, do, to do exactly what it was promised to do. Right now, it's so far deviated from that. We've given the space, Nick, this last hundred years that you mentioned, yeah. the further that more and more of civilization has disconnected from nature, the more there's been space for evil to come into that void. So evil is filling the void of disconnection from nature. And that evil are things like deception, manipulation, disconnection. So when someone that has a self-dealing interest is trying to sell memes of consumerism and people are disconnected from nature, that evil is able to succumb and fill that spirit, the body, the soul, the vehicle, the vessel. I see what you're saying. I wouldn't, I mean, I, I think the disconnection, I would think of it a lot in terms of like, in group, out group. So why, why do people behave the way they do? So I think there's a lot of people who really don't want to hurt anybody. Like who I would call like fundamentally good. They care about the people around them. They don't want to intentionally hurt anybody. But I think there's a lot of apathy that's arisen from seeing an increasingly wide out group who they're hearing scary things about. And social media has absolutely fed that. I don't, I wouldn't call that like any sort of intentional evil, but it is a terrifying consequence of disconnection from each other. Like, how many people did somebody in the 1880s, 1890s talk to on an average day? In person, physically talk to. How many people do you and I talk to? I think there is a big disparity. And I think that disconnection from each other has done a lot of that harm. And disconnection from what sustains us. The thing that provided you and I and all of us with a life we are disconnected from. Provides. We're disconnected from the provider. Providers. And the deeper that disconnect has become, 
the more errors we found in civilization. The less of a disconnect there is when more and more people become consciously connected to nature, what sustains them? And through simple mechanisms like being grateful for that, even the breath, being grateful for the water that sustains you, being grateful for the food. That despite the fragility of life, here we are. The how many millionth generation. We, we were given the most beautiful thing in the world, which is life. We were given life. And we've disconnected ourselves so, so far away from the source of life. So far away. <clears throat> and that is what all these malevolences, why they have occurred. So I think that that unifying theory of what is going on around us is become one of the most important for me to embed into the conversations that I have with these tech science leaders that we have on the program. And it's been so fascinating watching, <laughs> watching the reactions. It's been so fascinating. The little tiny nudges that we can make to help each other connect more consciously to nature, the more we will see the problems of society fade away over time. The hungriest of those that are in power still clinging to megalomania, clinging to corruption, clinging to deception, will be eradicated with more people consciously connecting. They will literally see it as an evil thing that they do not want to partake in anymore. But right now, it's still propagating the meme of, I get a Lambo, I get a Rolex, I get a house, I get the things, material, material, women, drugs, money. It's just ticking, ticking all over the Instagram feeds. That is the, ma that is the vast majority of content is not conscious, enlightened content. And so the memes are propagating at rapid speeds and causing further disconnection. The, the level of global chaotic chaos that's occurring right now, collective chaos, unprecedented. The ecosystems are screaming at us. We don't even realize that when we do something like pollute, that it affects everything else. This is not a single I consume a piece of plastic, put it in the garbage, and it's gone forever. That gets buried in the landfill, that gets into the landfill and the ecosystems of our planet. It's the biggest systems thinking problem we have. There's only a few orders of magnitude our universe will permit us to grow. So when we, when, we, when we take something like the civilization growing by orders of magnitude, it is one thing to have a spiritually connected civilization to it, the rock that nourishes it and then go, all right, let's see what we can make um, to explore the cosmos and have 100 billion people instead of 10 billion people living here. It's a completely other thing to be, have seven plus billion people completely disconnected from nature and then have other megalomaniacs that are playing with the toys of gods trying to escape from the rock and go into the cosmos. Because this is a story that is cyclical. It's happened before. Those with power play with the toys of God, disconnect from nature, civilization collapses. Those with power play with the toys of God, megalomaniacs, nature comes at you, civilization collapses. It's a cycle, it's been happening. It's gonna happen again if we don't consciously connect. Do you think, do you think a civilization who is deeply connected to their planet would rise up to explore the cosmos. Yes, absolutely. What is their, what is their motivation? Exploration. 
also to be with other celestial bodies physically. It's exciting. It's exciting. It's if, for example, if if everyone on the planet was like the the Kogi tribe, the one in uh, Colombia, twenty thousand of them, in the um, Santa Maria de Marta um, Andean, the Andes, okay. the northern part of the Andes. Okay. If everyone on the planet was like them, then I agree with you that there would be like the greatest stewardship and passion for, for nature, for where we come from. Um, and so it'd be like, hmm, shall we really figure out how to leave this rock? Right? That's the yeah. question. So younger brother, this is the narrative they have. Older brother is connected to nature, connected to spirit. Younger brother is disconnected from nature and spirit. Younger brother is the one that does all of the creative technology, all that stuff. If younger brother was more aware of nature and spirit, it would be more consciously making technology and creativity. But right now it's doing this and that and this and that and this and that. that it's overwhelming our civilization with disconnection from nature. And it's caused the self-dealing, non-inclusive stakeholding. It's caused all of those issues. So by, by getting younger brother more connected to, to nature and spirit, we can have younger brother that can still do things like make cool cosmic voyages. Okay. That's fair. I was thinking was something about like, it, it's easy if you're really in harmony to be content. And if you're content, it's hard to summon motivation to change. I think you do need a little bit of a balance there. And I think that younger brother, older brother captures that. Yeah, see, in the yin and yang, this has been for a long, long time, these, this all, but all part of one, all part of source, all part of what has birthed us into the world. The man and woman, again, the younger brother, older brother dynamic, the good and evil. When, again, when our spirit is not connected to nature, we leave a void within us for deception, for evil to come in. We don't even consciously realize the programming that we live in in culture. We have to step back, step into spirit. Oh, I'm a divine being that was given life on this rock and I'm so blessed for it. Oh, drinking water, eating food, I'm so blessed for the nourishment. Doing that cyclically, being by the ocean, being by the woods, feeling trees, feeling water, feeling animals, feeling those things at the deepest, most visceral ways, solves all of the issues in civilization. It's a first order, first principle error that we're at. Everything else is a band-aid. Everything else is a second order, third order solution that is causing more issues. It's a hard solution to implement. It's only as hard as our uh, re repatterning our behaviors to go unconsciously connect to nature. And then to help share that meme of how beautiful the experiences are with others and have others also respect the sacred lands of our planet, the sacred interconnectedness of everything. <laughs> this has been the worldview update on, yeah. on land. Yeah, what do you think about it? You've been giving me some, but what do you think about yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, I. I don't think I've really been hiding. Like, I think, I think I've seen a lot of, I, I think the balanced narrative has something to it. Like, I think there's a lot of ways to encapsulate that. Yeah. Like, you could think of it as, I, I, I really don't like the good evil because I don't think either of them is bad. I think the excess of them is both bad. Mm. Mm hmm. Like, I mean, I, I think you could call it contentedness and discontentedness. 
Like that that's kind of what fits naturally to me. Like you have if you're too discontent, like <laughs> life sucks. Um you you end up spending 16 hour days working on something to make the world better and killing yourself over it. And that's not good. But if you're so content that you're not willing to step out and make things better, things never get better than they were. And you're stagnant. Like, you need the desire to make things better, but like the contentedness to see all the good that's already there. It's, um, oh, what is the idea? Um, I can't remember where it came from, but the idea that a virtue lives between two vices. That virtue is sort of the absence of excess. This all brings us to the relationship between the older brother and the younger brother. I'm glad yeah. that I'm glad that you I mean, like that. I think there are different ways to talk about it. But, but we're so severely yeah. disconnected from nature that we see all of the malevolences that are here right now. So that is a first order issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah. And I think I think the solution to it is pretty complex. It's within us. It's within all of us. And the shelves people put up around them don't make that easy to get to. And the, sh the shells, uh, these barriers, these shields that exist are only there because of our initial disconnection from nature. The mamas, yeah. these spiritual leaders, they, from zero to nine, they're birthed into a cave. The mom is there and other previous mamas are there with them. And they work on their connection to earth for nine years in wow. darkness. And then they leave the cave and see the world for what it is. <laughs> Plato would be proud. Nine years of input, of connection to nature, and nothing else. That's why. Yeah. That's why. That's why these mamas, these indigenous leaders, they speak with the deepest sense of connection to spirit and nature that I've ever in my life heard. Deepest. Everyone else that talks is like talking from their heads. Everyone else I've heard talk, talks from their heads. Some people, especially some like spiritual women, know how to like drop more into their hearts and their guts and their bodies, like of course. But mostly in the intellectualizing, mentalizing, cognizing civilization, most people are just stuck in their heads. And these mamas, these spiritual leaders, they're they're like in the interconnectedness of everything all the time. Moment to moment, they are just in the interconnectedness of everything. They really see the world differently. I highly recommend watching Aluna, which is a documentary about, okay. about what they're trying to communicate to the world. Wake up, younger brother. We need you to wake up now. We need you to consciously connect to nature to remember where you came from and what sustains you. You can still be creative, but please wake up to that conscious connection to nature. I know my role now. I'm, no, I'm learning my role much better now. My, my role is to help make sure that there's a playground in the future. And one of the ways is through connecting the indigenous wisdom of the planet with the science and technology leaders of the planet across not just San Francisco and LA, Silicon Valley and the media culture, tech and media, but also to 
New York and finance to London to Tel Aviv to China. The world The over. Middle East, yeah, the world, the world, the world, all these massive economic centers of tech and business and science and finance, etc. They need to consciously connect to nature in order for us to have a playground for our children and their children and moving forward. This is one of the most pivotal moments in a civilization's trajectory when they finally have a population explosion on their planet and an exponential technology explosion on their planet. And then, then younger brother is so f disconnected from source and spirit. This is such a pivotal transitional moment. Can younger brother win the wisdom race? Can they wake up on time? Yeah. That's the role. Hopefully, hopefully that's what I can help with. And wow. Yeah. So this is one of the things, you know, you have these first robotics kids. How connected are they to nature as they connect with robotics and programming? How do you see the big picture? their connection to nature and spirit at young ages will permeate into every other aspect of their lives. Everything. Their interpersonal relationships with each other, with their families, with their coworkers down the line, with everything, with the world around them on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. It changes everything. Any sort of, of malevolent Thing, deception that they see in the world of potentially things that they can work on that are deceiving, they will see that with greater vigilance if they connect more to nature. That's another thing. There's like millions of these kids that are in robotics programs around the world. It's so important for them to connect to nature. Damn, this 17-year-old, which is Mama's son, Hanan, yeah. oh my gosh, the 17-year-old's presence is insane. I've never seen such an awakened soul. 17. So awakened for 17. Just such groundedness. It was so beautiful. So beautiful. Yeah. And just like so not deceived. Whenever we feel like the connection to nature or spirit's gone, it means that we are being deceived. That is source. That is nature. That's what sustains us. If we're not connected to what sustains us, something is deceiving us. Deceive feels like a weird word to use there. We've made a void, and deception has filled that void. It's deception. But deception, like... <sighs> the social fabric is full of deception now. I think deception is more... It's more a symptom than a cause. Deception is a symptom of the first principle, which is our disconnection from nature. But calling it... Like saying deception seeps in has this agentive... It does. Sense? There is. There are people that they themselves are disconnected from nature to yes. such a degree that they make memes that then seep into other people's programming. I, I hesitate to call them like res, responsible or malevolent for that. It is what it is. And our responsibility is to connect ourselves yeah. consciously and then to help. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, like, empathetically, it's hard. It's hard to call someone who's been sold a story that the world is a certain way and you should have a certain goal and here's things that aren't so. Anything but a victim. Just a different kind of victim. If we're born into connection to nature, there's no way to be deceived. 
when we're consciously connecting every moment to nature, there's no way to be deceived. That's the true essence. That's what sustains us. So anyway, this has been, <laughs> yeah, this has been, this has been good, Nick. I'm glad that we got to, to do some conversation. Let's go to the, the QRI. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Quality Research Institute has an event that's happening on art and consciousness. Looking forward to attending that with you. All right, let's do it. Good job, Nick. Thank you.